Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Hiroki. Uh, I, it's actually my great pleasure to be here because I always wanted to come to this workshop, the Open End Revolution, uh, over the last couple of several years. But always, you know, uh, every time I want to go there, there is another thing that I have to do, like a chairing a session or running another workshop. This is my first time coming here, so I'm pretty sure I'm still learning a lot of literature and concepts that, that has been developed over the several years. So this year, uh, I was fortunate enough to submit two papers, and I'm going to present the one this morning, uh, another one, which is uh, my own work. So this uh, morning, this talk is uh, actually the collaboration with Howard Fati. Uh, how many people know him, Howard Fati? So, sorry, so this is more like the exposing your age, right? <laughs> yeah, so this is a collaboration with him, and uh, you know, basically most of the ideas I'm explaining today, this morning, in this talk, is coming from him, and I'm basically uh, serving as the conveyor of his ideas. So he has, he's very still active. I'm going to show you who he is. So this is a proof that this, I'm not faking up, that I'm actually working with him. Uh, he's now in the retirement home in the western Massachusetts. He's now the 92 or so. Yeah, he's still very active. Every time I visit him and uh, engage in discussion, he has a very organized, you know, topic list, and he has specific agenda to discuss with me. So, this is uh, Howard Patti, uh, a physicist, uh, the PhD in Stanford University back in the 50s, and he also uh, uh, has done a lot of phenomenal work on theoretical biology and uh, several core issues of the artificial life including biosemiotics, how the physical chemical system can actually create symbolic, you know, languages, right? Like gene, uh, energetic systems, and many other stuff. So he is one of the key players of explaining the emergence of symbolic systems. And also he has published several phenomenal books on the hierarchy theory back in the 70s, even before the complex system became the thing. And also the origin of life. So he participated in the very first artificial life conference in Los Alamos back in the 87. So uh, he's actually part of the reason why I actually decided to go to Binghamton back in 2006, because that's the place where, where Howard Party is. When I joined the department, uh, you know, he was already well <laughs> retired. So, but finally this year, I had the chance to visit his place a couple times. So this is how this talk is about. Okay. So, uh, the, maybe I should go back to the title. So this a little bit uh, controversial topic to this particular audience. Uh, for his honor, I, I would say this is something I created, not his, you know, his uh, wordings. But when I proposed a little bit jokingly, he really liked it. So we just keep using this phrase: evolved, open-ended list, not open-ended evolution. Of course, I came here because I want to work on open-ended evolution, but. Uh, one of the take-home messages Howard Patti wants you to think about is that maybe you know, looking at open-endedness from a different viewpoint uh, expands the research program we can develop in the coming years. So that's the whole point. Okay. So, well, everybody knows what open-ended evolution is, so I'm going to skip this slide. So from the typical artificial life viewpoint, we usually consider uh, open-ended evolution as uh, kind of the... the uh, us, as a designer, to specify the nature of the physical system, chemical system, so that we can actually create artificial evolutionary processes taking place in the artificial system, right? So in that sense, the, by taking this viewpoint, open-ended evolution is the, the uh, prerequisite property that the system as a whole needs to have in order to harbor the open-ended evolution inside it. So that's a typical, I, I'm also part of the Oh, this camp. I design stuff, try to promote open-ended evolution inside my system. Okay, so that was the, the younger, naive Hiroki Sayama. You know, with this idea going to Howard Patti, uh, Professor Patti. So this is a really cool topic. So can we collaborate on that? And then he uh, said, mm. "So that thinking implies the following, right?" Uh, and this is a great moment when you see the great mind. Right? So open-ended evolution, uh, so based on this view, it must be enabled, facilitated by sufficiently complex laws of physics, which is absolutely true. Our universe is, uh, has the complex physical rules so that you know, whatever creatures uh, that might evolve is already taking the free form complexity coming from the universe. That's absolutely true. Like John von Neumann's, uh, you know, self-replicating cell automata has a very complex state transition rules, and our 
uh, proteins, uh, you know, the protein following process. It's a very computationally in, uh, expensive process, but it takes place for free, right? So that means that the open-ended evolution depends on open-ended environment. Is that really the meaningful statement? And also, open-ended evolution is a trait of the whole evolutionary system. Yes. So. And because Howard Patti is coming from the physics and biology, he suggested an alternative view back to me. So let's step back. Let's take a more natural biological physical viewpoint. And how can you reframe the uh, open-endedness? So he strongly claimed to me that open-ended evolution is actually the outcome of the evolution itself. That was the eye-opening moment for me. So, uh, so that's the, what he suggests. Instead of saying OEE, -E, let's swap the, uh, the letters. EOE, -E, evolved open-endedness. Maybe we are discussing the same thing, but this actually provides you the different viewpoint. Instead of trying to design everything from scratch, let's have the system figure out and create the mechanism for open-endedness to flourish in the course of evolution. Okay? So this is the key idea of this talk. So evolution uh, began with very simple self-replicating cells or maybe molecules that probably billions of years ago did not have enough capability to harbor the open-endedness. This is for sure. So that must mean that open-endedness actually came out through the over time, right? So this is not a new idea. The many similar ideas are already discussed even in the modern synthesis back in the, you know, the early 20th century. Uh, Holden, he is one of the key players. I just heard from the Howard Patti that he actually had a really interesting experience talking to the Holden you know, in person. Holden was very critical about the Howard Patti. Young Howard Patti, he was a PhD student. He was presenting some theoretical work, and the Holden was hated every single aspect of what uh, Howard Patti said. So pretty much everybody is experiencing a similar experience you know, when you see the big names. So, and the evol <laughs> evolution of evolvability, very similar idea, there are some differences, and obviously the major transition <coughs> evolution. Each and every piece of this literature somehow explains the evolution of open-endedness uh, in the course of time. Okay. So what kind of new direction of research this viewpoint can provide us? So first, by thinking the open-ended evolution as the outcome of evolution, we can discuss the taxonomies, what types of open-endedness, you know, and out of at what kind of hierarchical level it can arise. Uh, second, we can also uh, characterize the levels or degrees of open-endedness and their spatial and temporal variations, even inside the terrestrial uh, life evolution. That's actually one sample we can discuss at what time if the open-endedness was high, at what time open-endedness was low, where you know, it was promoted more than others. So those discussions can be uh, made if you consider open-endedness as outcome of evolution. <clears throat> and third, we can also discuss the open-endedness as the as what kind of uh, benefit or maybe disadvantage that open-endedness could bring into the evolution process. We can come up with some qualitative, quantitative measurements. And finally, we can also discuss several different mechanisms that we can uh, utilize uh, <coughs> to, you know, uh, select or maybe select for, select against open-endedness. Okay. And probably more. So these are just the ideas we came up with. So in the rest of the talk, I think I have about 10 minutes or so, right? So uh, I'm going to give you some examples that actually happened in the real evolutionary history so that you can get a you know, more tangible idea. The first example is obviously the symbolic system. So genetic languages and human languages those are the two, probably, you know, Howard Patti says that these are probably the two only examples of languages that evolved, that have a universal descriptive power, right? It's clear that they didn't exist when the universe was created, right? So this must have evolved. And once the languages, either genetic ones or human spoken ones, are created, that completely changed the rule. So you can describe a lot more combinatorial large types of specification by using these languages. So that's the definitely one example of the something that evolved over time that created open-endedness. Second example, uh, this is uh, my favorite example. I'm going to give another talk based on this uh, uh, concept. The formation of higher levels of entities. 
like two <coughs> molecules working together or two organelles you know, working together, as soon as they start uh, behaving like a single united entity, that opens up a uh, way greater number of possibilities because of combinatorial increase of possibilities. And you can combine species to species to form another co uh, symbiotic state. Humans can work together to create another organizational structure, so they all create the, uh, the open-ended landscape by uh, forming a higher order entities. The third example is the acquisition of new modality of perception, such as the, some molecular machines becoming able to sense the chemical gradient. That sounds very primitive, but must be a groundbreaking discovery, how to sense the environment. As soon as you gain the new perceptional modality, it automatically creates the internal representation of that information. That leads to the more complex uh, uh, you know, sensory motor coupling and also the intention, motivation, eventually leading to potential cognition and intelligence. So these, uh, all of the examples, and also the, you know, I forgot to mention, optical sensing, like the invention of eyes. Right? Once you get eyes, the strategy space suddenly becomes much, much greater than you know, if, uh, without any optical perception. So those are three examples I want to point out. So all of these examples, uh, the evolution of the symbolic languages and the formation of hierarchical structures and the gaining the new perception modalities, uh, they are very different from each other. And uh, they are not necessarily a straightforward adaptation. You can think about it. It takes a lot of costs. And like, you know, when you, know, you can speak, then you, know, you need to invest a lot of time and effort to gain the, that ability, but it's not so clear that what is the immediate adaptive benefit. So in that regard, this is not a simple the adaptive uh, process. It's something more than, more than that. And what are common among those three cases are that they were definitely acquired over time through evolution, and uh, they made a disruptive change in the evolutionary game and they significantly expanded the possibility space. So, by com uh, contrasting those two, the OEE and the EOE, um, if you consider the open-endedness as a property of the entire system, you can still discuss those three major transitions as a one particular trajectory, thank you, uh, taking place in a very already a priori rich universe. Or if you take e the EOE approach, you can consider these evolutionary events as a really the key uh, defining events where the, the basically the rule set completely changed. So these uh, discussions is somewhat trivial to some of you, but I think it's a very profound issue for many of us. So a couple of things I want to point out. The open-endedness does not necessarily mean the sustainability or survival. It's not always a good thing to have. For example, if you have a very chemically, physically solid rock. They can survive for billions of years without any you know, uh, perturbation. In contrast, we are the more open-ended entities, but we are more fragile. Though, you know, though we will uh, probably go extinct in the next 100 years. No, maybe not 100 years. <laughs> Hopefully not, maybe the 10,000 or you know, 100,000 years. You know. So definitely we are not sustainable. And all of the, essentially all of the, the living creatures that emerged in this year, uh, in the planet that got extinct. So they were not open-ended, right? So, and definitely they also had about the same amount of open-endedness as, as we do. So having open-endedness does not necessarily mean survival, right? And also we are lucky ones that are, who actually survive uh, alive right now, but the, I don't think we are more open-ended than other ones. So that's also another issue. So this implies that maybe the open-endedness, the evolved open-endedness might be defined based on the, some kind of scope so how long you see, how big you see, how you capture the dynamical process, it really depends on the, your scope. So this is something that we should carefully more discuss more to deepen our understanding. So to summarize, the, uh, we just want to in, uh, emphasize the importance of the considering the open-endedness as the outcome of evolution instead of prerequisite condition for the evolution. And this, we hope, allow us to, uh, you know, uh, explore more uh, different types of research questions. So this also requires some major reconceptualization of how to capture the evolutionary process. But I hope that by thinking in both ways, you know, 
OEE and EOE probably is helpful for this community to explore the, you know, many different ways to reach what we want to have. Thank you very much. So, yeah, we, we unfortunately only have one microphone, so um, uh, now we have time for a few questions. So, please remember that you have to speak loud and clear when you uh, ask questions. Yeah. Or, uh, now, I'm trying to summon Howard Fabi here. Yeah. Yes. I really enjoyed that, uh, Hiroki, and uh, yeah. I'm Howard. Howard, yeah. Um, I, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think Howard has written some of the, the most um, yeah. sort of profound work on open ended definitions. Um, yeah. uh, you want to the the well, actually, it's just a, a comment that this, this idea of the evolution of genetic language yeah. and human language. Um, is Neil Sparicelli, who, um, yeah, who, yeah. who was the first person to do A-Life research in the John Norman's group. Um, he wrote a paper in 1987, um, it was his last paper oh, on, really? um, on artificial life, um, talking about the evolution of, of language. Do you have a question? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, it's a comment. Um, so the, the comment is, and it's just, um, that was the same year that the first yeah. um, uh, a life conference. Is that part of the first proceedings or not? No, he, it wasn't in the proceedings. Okay. He, he, Baratelli didn't come, but oh. it was just a, it was just such a shame, sort of a, that moment in history yeah. when um, Patty was at the conference. Yeah. Yeah. Baratelli was just doing his last publication, but they never met. But oh. um, yeah, yeah, a missed opportunity. A missed opportunity. Yeah. But um, yeah, great work. Yeah. Please send me the link. I'm going to pause it, so, yeah. yes, you have a question? Maybe you should come up here. Why don't we, if anybody has questions, then come up so everybody can hear. So, yeah, I have a lot of things that are actually not questions that I'll um, talk to you about later. <laughs> but um, one question I want to ask is just if we're kind of reframing the way we think about things, which I think is extremely useful, and like kind of including more of this abiotic kind of evolutionary stuff, do you think the way that like what we mean by evolution changes if we're thinking about things differently, or is that mostly still the same? Absolutely. <laughs> I actually think that the, my way of thinking the evolution has always been very different from traditional you know, genotype, phenotype type of stuff. You know, uh, I'm going to confess, I never ever programmed genetic algorithms in my life. Oh. Yeah. So I always use the artificial chemistry type of lower level interaction causing some, uh, you know, the emergence of a high order structure. And that is already, you know, changing the, how we describe the evolution, right? So I think in order to understand those, uh, you know, Evolution of open endedness itself, we really need to go down and then try to break up the all the existing idea of evolution so that evolution itself can be more how can I say? I'm going getting to the tautological argument, but you know, it should be more free from our pre conceptualization of evolution. That's my theory. If that answers your question. So we have uh, maybe do you want to come up? So if you have a question then please come up. Here, uh, so so stay, form a little line. We have a couple of, of minutes here, and then could you make your 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 presentation ready so we don't lose time by? Uh, um, oh my goodness, yes, this is a <laughs> so uh, Howard, um, yeah, so good good to have the reconceptualization. Yeah. It's definitely useful to do that. But I wonder how you would respond to the fact that. There are artificial evolutionary systems which simply will not and cannot ever be open-ended. How do we actually interpret that in light of the idea that open-endedness is expected to evolve? I, I don't think I have a clear answer, but I know Hiroki does some work there, so he is <laughs> talk this afternoon, so please come to his talk. <laughs> okay. uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a curiosity stemming from ignorance perhaps. So I was wondering, in, in, um, so in, in the natural evolution, in the evolution of nature, there is there is no real termination. So termination happens only when species go extinct. Whereas in, in computational evolution, there's always a termination. So the, almost always, like the, you, you, you run an algorithm to, 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 to look for the... Yeah, yeah. For the maxima, yeah. with, with so um, how how do those compare? I'm not really understanding that. So if you can yeah. illuminate yeah, me on that. So the definition of word algorithm requires that, that the process needs to terminate in the final process, and then that means that the evolution is not an algorithm. 
and the computation itself does not have to stop in the finite time, right? So in that sense, the uh, it is definitely possible to create an you know, endless process, and uh, in order for the evolution to be open, then it must be endless. Yeah, but that we cannot call it algorithm. So right. So. Right. So, so there, is, there is a no, but there is a difference between uh, uh, optimization yes. and and uh, expansion in uh, uh, as as we heard and many of us will talk about. Yes. So so you should stick around, and I think you'll get tired of hearing this later on in in, in this yeah. in this afternoon because we will discuss exactly that issue. Like, and it is it is confu it is a little bit confusing, but I don't want to start stop, my right? talk no, now. Uh, I'm afraid it's a comment as well. I tried to figure out how to make it into a question. Anyway. <laughs> um, I, I, I think this is absolutely the right way of thinking about open-ended evolution. There's just one little thing I wanted to add, which is that I do think we are more open-ended than, uh, than the things that came that, that went extinct. Um, oh. uh, and I think that... <laughs> <laughs> um, well, simply because if you are not open-ended, you're more limited in... The, the innovations that you can create in the new environments you can adapt to and uh, over over geological time that does make a difference you're more eventually to, you're more likely to become extinct eventually so there can be actually a selection pressure I think that's the, the subject of discussion among the I think you're coming okay. yeah. so I have an actual question okay. <laughs> so um, if open-endedness evolves yeah. then it must confer some survival advantage on someone or something. Yeah. I can I can see how it would confer survival advantage on the group, but what about individual selection? If I'm more open-ended than you, how does that help me? We merge together to form the single individual, right? Ah, okay. yeah. So th that's actually a very important issue. As long as we discuss the evolution in a very traditional way, we always consider individuals. Right. That concept itself is subject to question, I think. Yeah. Uh, just for fun, because I, I like to pick your brain. Um, so, so uh, at the end, you, you sort of mentioned something about um, state spaces of like you know our it, 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 uh, if you can imagine the universe as being like uh, you know imagine having all possible arrangements of atoms. I mean, it's a really really large a number of states that the universe can be in. It's not useful at all because we can't even you know imagine how large that is. But um, that's one way to think about it as uh, biology navigating that sort of space. But the other way that you mentioned was that it may have a sort of uh, state space, and then at some point it defines a new state space. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to know if you if you had any further thoughts on that, and what's maybe the most useful way to think yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think ultimately uh, the 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 OEE viewpoint is right. Right. So here the universe it has a uh, very rich landscape. Everything takes place can be understood as just a trajectory. So here, what we are discussing is that maybe the EOE might be more useful for us, even though they basically describe exactly the same process, right? So I don't know. So this is more like the bringing the idea to the community, uh, our community so that we can start discussion. Yeah. But I don't know. Maybe the universe is expanding, so it may not be finite in terms of possibility. I'm not a physicist, but yeah, that's a fundamental question. Yeah, and we have a lot of parallel universes, some, some physicists yeah, say. Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know. But anyway, so, so I'll, maybe I should just, uh, s s before you go and, and be a little uh, more critical, because um, uh, when you did some of these examples, I, I, I agree with the, the, the sentiment of what you, you were talking about, but I think that uh, the, the primitive sensing of chemical gradients you actually have in a petri dish with oil and um, and, yeah. and some special yeah. you, know, you have, yeah. need to have some surfactants and whatnot. Yeah. So so measuring a, a chemical gradient and actually following that is really simple. You don't need to. So I don't think that constitutes a, 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 a what's it called a, a, an evolutionary yeah. breakthrough. That, I think that's the no fair question. Yeah, so 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 yeah. we so you so you have to go back and talk to yeah. Hiroshi and and clean it up a little okay. bit. Yeah. <laughs> I will, I will. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.